Welcome to Garden Gossip, Big Blend Radio's home and garden show. Come on, let's grow together. Hey, everybody, welcome to our Garden Gossip show. Today, we are going to New Jersey to go gardening in the Garden State. Why not? Um, we're going to be talking about a book by Re- Reish Gala, and it is called Vegetable Gardening Made Easy, Simple Tips and Tricks to Grow Your Best Garden Ever. And going through the book, I have to tell you, uh, it, she really makes everything make sense. And we all have some common problems that we're like, why did our tomato grow this way? Or the carrot? Why does the carrot have like a little butt on it? You know, there's some weird things that happen in gardens, but she explains it all very easily. And um, is really inspirational in getting us to get out there and grow our own food so we know where our food comes from and so we can even save money um, in these days. So I encourage you to go to her website, 100tomatoes.com. The book is out now. So welcome to the show, Raish. How are you? I'm good. Thank you so much for the wonderful introduction. I'm well. Hope you're doing good too. We are doing good. We're doing good. So listen, I can see in your book. And so what I've done, like following you on social media, I see that you actually will go out and garden in the winter. Yes, absolutely right. In New right. Jersey. <laughs> what in is New Jersey. wrong with you? I'm just kidding. <laughs> I know it's um I think what's the temperature right now it's about 28 degrees Fahrenheit outside uh, we had some flurries yesterday and typically in December January um, February as well as sometimes in March we do get you know we've gotten up to two feet of snow but you know wow. what if you use the right gardening techniques and tools that are easily available out there to everybody you can extend your growing season, you can grow veggies year round in your garden. And you know, there's nothing better than just heading outside into your garden, picking some fresh veg and enjoying it in a meal, right? It doesn't matter the temperature or the weather. You don't even need a refrigerator where you are right now. (laughs) Exactly right. (laughs) (laughs) So do you grow according to season? I mean, are you growing tomatoes in the winter or more of like cooler crops like radishes and and spinach and things like that? So I definitely grow according to the season because that's the right thing to do. And the plants, they taste the best and they thrive the best in those conditions, you know, when you give them the right conditions. So I don't have like a greenhouse or something like that where I am, you know, moving a tomato and pepper plants indoors, you know, and growing them in winters. But instead, what I do is outside, I have raised uh, beds and I just install simple hoops and I cover it with six mil, which is the thickness of uh, this clear farm grade plastic. And that Mm -hmm. kind of creates, you know, an insulation, protects the veggies from the cold wind, the snow, and just kind of gives them, you know, a little bit of cozy, coziness inside so they can thrive. So in winter, I'm definitely growing the, you know, cool season veggies, radishes, like you said, kale, beetroot, carrots, Um, even bok choy. Lettuce is amazing. I harvested a big bowl of lettuce for my Thanksgiving meal and definitely will be doing the same, you know, to make a delicious salad for Christmas as well, which is shocking to most people. Um, I think Mm. most people, they, and I think the gardening centers sort of, you know, reinforce this idea that you can only grow during, you know, the spring and summer months. If you go to the gardening centers in September or in October, you're not going to find any plants over there to purchase, right? Uh, It's usually in springtime when you go and see those seedlings. So they are reinforcing this um, mindset that you can only grow between your last and first frost dates and nothing could be further than the truth. Because even if you didn't have covers or protection for your veggies, there are certain types of vegetables that are so cold hardy that can even grow in the snow, like cilantro is so cold hardy. So it's parsley and spinach, you know? So, mm. um, yeah. And then so you're I eating think... according to the season, which is exactly. actually better for your health and for your Absolutely. body. Absolutely. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And so when you have it underneath these, you know, the, the thick uh, plastic covers, covers, they're able to get the light as well, right? Yes. Yes. So a lot of these leafy green vegetables, they don't need um, as much sunlight as your fruiting crops, such as your tomatoes, cucumbers and peppers, which produce, you know, a flower and they are technically fruits, right? (laughs) So they don't need as much sunlight and they can thrive in four to six hours of filtered sunlight, which comes in through these covers. 
and um, it just works like magic. Yes, if you do have snowfall, you want to go out there and brush the snow off so then the light can continue to come in. But essentially, you're just creating a mini greenhouse or like a terrarium, you know, effect. Yeah. And what happens is by adding this one layer of cover over your um, veggies, it increases your growing zone by one to one and a half zones. So I'm technically in zone 6B. And by using these covers, my plants inside feel like they're, you know, currently in a zone 7B or a zone 8, which is okay. insane, right? Uh, but it just makes them warm and cozy inside. That's cool. So what got you started? I know you talk about this in the book about really, you know, trying to buy the tomatoes are really difficult to buy good tomatoes that taste good and aren't that waxy, like plasticky bland yeah you you and the texture is so gross um like you know so you, you know heirloom tomatoes and there's all kinds of tomatoes and I think that's one of the joys of growing if you can get your kids involved and grow heirloom crops that are interesting different colors like even potatoes and you were talking yeah. about beets you can get all these different colors that gets them excited and then maybe they'll eat their vegetables where they wouldn't before so you know if they're they've got their hand in it but uh, tell us all about your story of getting into this because you went through all the trials and tribulations and now you're helping people on the ground in, in you know, your region. You're actually helping them with their gardens. But now here you are with a book that can help people across the country, around the world effectively. Absolutely. Um, so I, I consider myself to be your average everyday gardener, you know, just a normal person who's interested in gardening. And my journey sort of started like that. Um, I used to see my friends, you know, talk about their homegrown tomatoes and, you know, being in the state of Jersey, I'm like, yeah, I should grow some tomatoes too. I mean, you know, why not? So I just headed, you know, this was about six years ago when for the first time I headed to a big box retailer and picked up, you know, um, two plants, two tomato plants. And at that point, just like any common person who has no experience in gardening, I didn't know anything about, you know, transferring them out of that pot or container into mm -hmm. a larger container, the kind of soil to use, um, how much sunlight those plants need or how often or not to water, <laughs> etc. you know, fertilizers. I didn't know any of that. And that a lot of times for many people can be overwhelming as well. So I started off honestly with failure to grow tomatoes. So I had those two tomato plants that I purchased, put them on my shaded deck um, outside, you know, yeah. and nothing grew. I got like just two rotten tomatoes and I was so disappointed. But, you know, the, 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 the part about being successful in anything, be it gardening or in any endeavor in life is basically not to give up, you know, when you fail one time and to consistently try and solve the problem. So when this happened, I was like, how can it be so hard to grow food when it's so easily and readily available outside at the grocery stores, at the you know farmers markets, everywhere, and, and you know, food is essential to uh, life. So how can mm -hmm. it be so difficult? It doesn't make sense. So that kind of you know led me on um, you know this journey where the following year I hired a landscaper and got him to build me four really small raised beds, two feet mm -hmm. by three feet, literally tiny. And uh, he didn't know anything about gardening. Like most landscapers, they just, you know, come in, add mulch and things like that. So he put in, you know, some of the soil in the, the vegetable garden was just like from a construction site, like really oh, no, hard, no. heavy clay, you know, with no. uh, rocks and pebbles. So nothing grew and I had all the pests and diseases come in to visit. <laughs> and so I was again disappointed. And that led me to, you know, do a lot of research. YouTube University is fantastic, right? <laughs> um, and so I, I realized that the crux to good, um, you know, produce and for healthy plants and for a good harvest is really the soil. That's essential. Everybody kept talking about just one thing, which is your soil, soil, soil. So I started composting, actually. That was the first step in my gardening journey, which was to start cool. composting. And when I added that compost, I changed the soil, added my homegrown compost, homemade compost, sorry, into my garden. It was like a day and night difference. The hmm. change was dramatic. The plants started looking healthier. They started thriving. There were less pests and diseases. Um, and so my journey started sort of from there. And, well, that um, makes sense, because mm -hmm. even as human beings, 
if we're strong, if our immune system is strong, we can handle things, you know, better that come our way. Isn't that for a plant, your soil is like the immune system of the plant, right? Exactly. Because we don't realize it, but the plants essentially, they pull all the nutrients, the nutrients that we eat when, I mean, when we eat our plants and our veggies and our fruits, the nutrients that we get from those fruits and veggies, those fruits and veggies get their nutrients from the soil that they pull up from the soil. So it's important and really essential to have very good soil that's full of organic matter and that kind of, you know, nourishes and feeds your plants because that in turn will feed our body and will be good for our health. Okay, so the soil, but now the soil is something I think people get scared of because now we're having to play weird science and we don't know and composting. Oh, is that going to have worms go into our next door neighbor's yard? Is it going to stink? Yet I think composting is a really healthy way for us to not be just throwing stuff in a landfill. Right. So it's something that's giving back. It's, you know, we look at recycling, we look at climate change. This is one way also to, when we have huge monocrop culture, right? That is not yeah. necessarily the best food for our, our bellies, right? Totally. So like immune systems, the soil, and for us as human beings, if we're growing organically, so I'm thinking you're probably doing a lot more on the organic side than yes. you know, eating a bottle of pesticides. So the stronger the soil, the stronger the food for us. Yes. And, you know, soil uh, for a lot of um, beginner gardeners or even for experienced gardeners, soil can become, you know, um, one of these topics which really confuses them because there are so many um, products available out there in the market today and people yes. don't know, you know, where to start. And then, you know, when you have too many choices, it leads to overwhelm, which leads to, you know, indecision, basically. So I think the point is to start with depending, you know, it doesn't matter what your budget is, buy the best organic soil that you can afford, but always amend it with compost. Um, mm -hmm. That is, you know, it doesn't matter, you don't need to add fertilizers, you don't have to use, you know, any other um, additions or additives to your soil, just add simple compost. And I think, you know, as a habit, I didn't realize how much this would affect me personally. When I started composting, it was mainly I was thinking, oh, you know what, I'm going to do this because I want, uh, you know, a big harvest. It's for my garden. But it sort of grows on you. And then you realize the impact that these small uh, things like saving your food scraps, your fruit and vegetable peels, um, the pulp from your juicing, all those things gonna add up. And then you realize the impact that even as an individual, you're having in a beneficial way on this planet, on the ecosystem, things like that by not wasting um, food. And essentially at the end of the day, you want to mimic nature. You want to, you know, if you don't have access to compost, you don't have the budget to buy, you know, uh, lots of uh, um, soil and things like that. Then even collecting dried leaves in fall, for example, putting it inside a garbage bag and, you know, poking some mm -hmm. holes in it and tying it up in a year or two that breaks down and creates leaf compost or leaf mold, you know, which because is it, it's, alive. it's alive. It's alive. It's alive. Exactly. It's alive. And then the earthworms, they feed on this and then they, their um, excretion creates the food which acts as a fertilizer for your plants. So it's sort of a cycle that um, anytime, you know, you add things from nature back into the soil, it's the way of life, basically. That's why I like mushrooms and fungus. I have a thing about it. I drive people nuts about it. But, I but know. This is, you know, but you also started talking about the fact of, you know, going in and trying to maybe, you know, start, you know, go and get carrots and radishes and, and get cold crops is hard to get. Um, so do, do you recommend people do seedlings and start from seedlings even um, for so winter? It depends. So for winter, you don't necessarily need to start from seedlings. You don't need to necessarily purchase seedlings because um, one of the big advantages is going into fall and winter months, you're coming out from summer. So the fall garden essentially is planted in late summer. Like, you okay. know, for me in New Jersey, that would be um, about, you know, one to two months before my first frost date. And that would be around, say, you know, July, August, so to speak. And so the soil is already warm and it is conducive for, you know, seedlings or seeds to germinate. So I don't 
plant, you know, I don't start as many seeds indoors as I usually would in spring. And if you're a mm -hmm. beginner and you can just grab a packet of lettuce from, you know, your local nursery or gardening center, it, you know, those are at least easily available instead of plants, right, in fall. So even if you can grab a packet of lettuce, for example, or a packet of spinach and just directly sow that in your garden in the soil, just fluff up your soil, the top, you know, six inches or so, add some compost to make it a little bit nutrient rich and then sprinkle in those seeds and you'll be shocked it's going to grow marvelously well. So you don't necessarily need to have seedlings. Even things like kale or broccoli, those, yes, I would recommend if it's possible for you to get seedlings to do that, just because the, you know, the insects and the caterpillars, they love to munch up on, you know, little seedlings of kale and brassica plants. So ideally you want to do that, but if you can't and you just put in your seeds in there and just cover it uh, a little bit, it will grow amazingly well. So because the soil is conducive, the temperature is conducive for, you know, germination. Huh. That's interesting. Now, also, um, you talk about, let's talk about the weird plants. Like I talked about the carrot butts. Like sometimes you pull, you pull out a carrot and it looks like a pair of legs and a little butt, and a little yeah. buttski. Um, so sometimes things happen in the garden, which are cute and funny. Um, so what causes that? You know, because you were talking about, you know, having straight carrots. Now, is, is it, a, I mean, if you don't get straight carrots, is there something wrong or is it just fun? I think it's fun. It, but. I think it's fun. Honestly, when you go to like one of those gourmet expensive restaurants, they serve, you know, carrots that are imperfect actually. And yeah. they charge you a good penny for it, right? <laughs> I mean, they look um, amazing. So there's nothing wrong if they're not perfect. At the end of the day, it's food, it's edible. And if you grew it yourself, I think it's even more valuable than anything else that you can buy. Um, so it's totally fine. However, I know all of us have the aspiration to grow the perfect tomato, to grow the perfect carrot, because we see that perfection outside in society at the grocery store. And so that is something that we aspire to. And there's nothing wrong with aspiring for that. Um, however, if you want to have the most perfect carrots, the secret is really a couple of things. One is you want to make sure that the soil is not too hard because carrots are essentially root vegetables and they mm -hmm. grow you know, under the ground, in the, under the soil. So if the soil is very hard for that um, root to be able to grow effectively, it might you know, bend and curve and then end up wonky like you were you know, talking about if the soil is hard. So make sure the soil that you fluff it up before you know, sowing the seeds for carrots. Mm -hmm. And then the second thing is also spacing. If you have too many seedlings that are crowded together and they don't have enough space to grow, they're going to fight with each other and mm. you won't get perfect carrots. Oh, we can't so, have that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We can't have that. No we black eyes go... allowed. <laughs> <laughs> so you want to go in, you know, once the seedlings are uh, a couple of inches long, you want to go in and thin them out. So you just have like one seedling of a carrot um, every, you know, two to three inches. And okay. uh, then you're, you're going to be just fine. And I like to use this very simple handy tool, which is your hand or your fingers. And I usually like to use my two fingers, my index finger uh -huh. and the middle finger as spacing between two carrots. Because carrots aren't going to be, you know, gigantic and big, but uh -huh. they are usually long. Um, and so you want to use your two finger spacing between your carrot seedlings. And then you know you're going to get straight carrots every time. It, it works like a charm for me. Wow. Wow. So now what about the bitterness? You talk about the bitterness and things like um, I have a friend who was growing amazing cucumbers. And then when I bit into the, the rind was like really, really bitter. What does that come from? So sometimes with cucumbers, for example, the bitterness can come from inconsistent watering. Um, and it's oh. also the variety that you choose to grow. So, um, and the third thing is, of course, you know, for if it's not a cucumber, say if it's a lettuce and you taste a leafy yeah. green that's extremely bitter, it right. could be because you're not growing it in the right season. So, oh. yeah. So with cucumbers, you want to make sure you water it consistently because if you don't water it consistently, you water it a lot one day and then you come back, you know, after a, a week or two and then water it again. Or, and then you continue watering it a lot every single day that can, you know, uh, mess up the taste and the flavor of the cucumbers as well. 
And um, I personally think the sweetest cucumbers are the ones that are the baby cucumbers or the dwarf sized cucumbers, they end up being the sweetest. And you also don't want to pick them too late. If you let them get really mature and big, uh, where the seeds get really large, then they will end up tasting, you know, quite a bit bitter. So you want to pick them when they're young and tender at a smaller size and just enjoy them fresh. They'll taste the sweetest then. Anything that is a baby dwarf variety, when you pick them earlier, um, will taste sweeter in general in terms of fruits and veggies. And um, when it comes to lettuce, however, you want to grow it in the right season. I oftentimes see people making the mistake of growing lettuce in summer. And uh, that in my books is a big no-no because when you grow lettuce in summer, it's going to end up growing really tall and tasting super bitter. But that same lettuce, if you grow it in spring and in fall, it's going to taste so sweet, like sweet, wow. like candy. And same thing for kale. My kids, they are like, they crave kale chips and anything with kale, which is like shocking to me. But I yeah. grow it exclusively in like fall and winter because the taste of kale, the taste of carrots, the taste of beetroot, when the frost has touched it, it turns the starches into sugars and makes the veg so sweet. It's, it's, I highly recommend it. It's an experience. It's so delicious. Wow, that's amazing about the, the different seasons. And I think when you're not consistent in watering, plants go into that protective mode. You yeah. know what I mean? It's like if you don't know, you know, people people do that. You know, if you don't know when yeah. your next paycheck's coming, you get into yeah. that thrifty survival mode so you're not making yeah. a fancy meal. You know, exactly. so it's that same thing. It's like, I don't know when water's coming. So I'm preserving and protecting. So the plant is like getting up tight. You yep. know what I mean? Exactly right. Exactly right. Exactly right. Yeah. Wow. It's interesting. It, it, you start to learn about nature. Did you think you were going to know all this? You know, you, you really start to understand, but it does go with our bodies. I think, you know, totally. it really does. It mm. totally, you know, I think there's such a harmony between nature and gardening and ourselves as human beings as well. Um, and when I started out, it wasn't something that I even, you know, intended for it to happen that way. But it's sort of like one of those things people don't realize how gardening starts affecting you, how you start changing your decision making, you start becoming more conscious about the environment. Um, you know, you want to recycle more, waste less things like that when you know you start gardening and growing your own food and um, I, I think everybody should grow something even if it's mm. just you know um, a basil plant in a pot yeah. on their windowsill um, but yeah. I think everybody should grow um, something for sure to understand understand the way of life uh, the one yeah. thing I also love about your book uh, vegetable gardening made easy is you have recipes for people, especially when it comes to zucchini. Oh my gosh, make <laughs> those muffins, right? Because yeah, it once they start, and it's good to kind of get to know your neighbors too, right? To to you know when you have a big harvest is to share, not just oh pour it and, and put back in your composting, you know. Exactly. I think you know that's one of the things we don't realize. At least I didn't realize that until I started gardening was how much food we were wasting. We would pick up stuff, you know, produce from the grocery store and it would just sit in the fridge a couple of days, three or four days and it goes bad and you end up throwing it. You know, it's um, however, if you grow your own food, you somehow feel it's so precious and valuable. It's like one of the most valuable commodities to you as a gardener. And then you don't want to waste it. You want to care for it more. And uh, it's amazing. And yes, you I, what I do is in order to, you know, enjoy all these garden harvests of mine. Every summer, I actually host a tomato tasting party uh, at oh, home wow. where I invite my friends and I get all these different varieties of tomatoes. Because when you go to the grocery store, you just buy a tomato. I mean, I've never yeah. seen a grocery list where it says, get me this, you know, pineapple tomato or a black cream wow. or, you know, one of those uh, Aunt Ruby's tomato. We don't hear that, right? When we see a grocery list, we don't see that. And so I love to host a tomato tasting party for my friends every summer where I invite them over and then I put all my gorgeous heirloom tomatoes with different colors, you know, orange, black, red, uh, yellow, all on display. Awesome. And then, you know, have them pick and taste and rank and rate which one is their favorite. <laughs> so, oh, now, now what about, what about, I know you're in New Jersey, so not in the South, but fried green tomatoes are absolutely if you go to the right restaurant and they do it it is like and I've never made them but like is that 
do you have you made them? Have you ever done that? Have you ever grown a tomato? And then is it? I mean, are there green tomatoes that are? I think there are actually. You know what? We yeah. were on a farm, and I did a lot of harvesting of tomatoes, eggplant, which bite you. Be careful with eggplant; they they can be mean. <laughs> um, eggplant and all kinds of peppers. Like I did not know all these variety of peppers, but trust me, you learn. And you learn according to rubbing your eyes in the field. Don't do that either. <laughs> <laughs> but but I really learned it was, um, you know, this this mini farm I, I was helping to take care of. And what we were doing was harvesting all of this produce for uh, the food bank, which to me was incredible because where it was, it, it was in North Carolina and was very multiculturally diverse. So I knew all these people were cooking with spices and things that, you know, meant something to them. And I felt so proud. I'm like, here, we got the produce, we got the eggs from the chickens, we've got all this, you're going to actually eat something that's not from a can, not from, you know, not those, like, it was all these kinds of tomatoes. And, you know, they would just fall apart in your hands, these heirlooms. It's like, if you harvested the heirlooms, you needed to run to the food bank that day. For heart. You did yeah. not pick them until they were ready to be, you know, you need to get them to the next person. But some of those tomatoes, I remember being, these are white tomatoes or green tomatoes, I think they called them, where they don't change color. So the my favorite variety is called the Aunt Ruby's um, German green tomato. And okay. it's, it's green in color when it's raw and it remains green in color when it's fresh and ripe as well. Uh, so it's it's hard to tell when it's ready to pick. Um, however, when you touch it and give it like, I call it a squeeze test, you know, it has to just have a little bit of give. So you know yeah. the tomato is ready. Um, and believe me, it's one of the most delicious tomato. It's like my forever tomato. I always grow it every year in the garden. Um, I highly recommend it. It's so good. Aunt Ruby's green German tomato. And oh, so um, that could be good for fried green tomatoes. Yeah, so any any uh, unripe tomato you can use for fried green tomatoes as well. Um, and a lot of people, especially at the end of the growing season when it starts getting cooler and the tomatoes take a really long time to ripen or if you're in New Jersey or any cold place like, you know, I am in and um, it takes a long time to ripen uh, your tomatoes. But you know that the frost is coming. You can harvest those tomatoes and slice them up. And definitely you can make your own fried green tomatoes for sure with that. Oh. I like to make um, a, a green tomato salsa as well, which is oh. so delicious, you know, and with um, you just Ooh. roast them on the fire. These, oh. uh, you know, these raw green tomatoes, you roast mm. them on the fire. Um, so it gives a little smoky flavor to, to it. And you add that with some roasted garlic and a little bit of cilantro and onion and salt and lemon juice and just tastes incredible with like chips and it's like a dip it's good for like a super bowl party literally <laughs> have you done tomatillos at all i don't know if you can do those in your area tomatillos you can you small. can i i have grown tomatillos for my clients uh who wanted to you know grow them just for their salsa so i've definitely grown those and yes you can grow them as well however mm -hmm. my favorite over the tomatillo is the ground cherry actually um, my mouth is almost watering thinking of Aunt Molly. I know you Brown just bring cherry. up the Have you had tomatoes. Those? You say say tomatoes and you're smiling from ear to ear. You're like, I know, tomatoes. you know. Yeah. Well, <laughs> who doesn't love tomatoes? You can you can see my company is named Hundred Tomatoes because I love tomatoes yeah. so much. <laughs> that's it. That's it. I love it though, because that's that is like the it's so weird because they're actually quite easy, but at the same time, the most difficult plant to have like the, what you want, you know? Yeah. So, um, no, I, I love that. So everyone, 100tomatoes.com and that's um, 100 spelled out. So uh, for yeah. everyone to go to your website, but everyone, the book again uh, by Resh Galas, R-E-S-H-G-A-L-A is Vegetable Gardening Made Easy, Simple Tips and Tricks to Grow Your Best Garden Ever. And um, very excited for it to be out. And go to 100, or just go 100tomatoes.com. And i um, very excited for everyone to be able to get that and start planning and start doing, right? You don't have to wait till spring. You can get going now. You can get, get going. going now. You can get going now. Even if it's some herbs, even if it's some lettuce, even if it's some microgreens, that's all you can do oh. right now. You can get going right now. And um, if, if you can't find me, you can also find me at reishgala.com. 
Um, okay, that's, there you go. That's another, yeah. yeah. And, and you're on Instagram as well? I'm on everyone? Instagram as well, yes. Very cool. At Very Rish cool. And, and everyone too, um, you know, when we think about the new year, 2024, this is an excellent New Year's resolution that you can keep for you and your family. And even if you're in a community garden, because a lot of people have to do community gardens, you can do it patio gardens, right? You can, you can do, Absolutely. You can do something. Absolutely. Yes, you can I definitely do something. And um, I know I'm part of a community garden here in New Jersey too. And it's an excellent resource if you're, you're a beginner gardener and don't have the space, don't know where to start. I think if you're part of a community garden or an allotment style mm -hmm. garden, you can learn a lot from your fellow gardeners as well. So highly encourage that. And you get extra pollinators that way too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah it, 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 it's it's really true because they'll plant something that brings in yep. the bees for you so it's it's a good thing and i know your book also talks about self-pollination which is also a big deal is you know poll uh, pollinating your squash and your tomato plants and and all of that too so you really go into everything but you do keep it easy and fun in your book which i really appreciate because when it starts getting too scientific i know half of us our brains go I don't understand. I never will. It's like this immediate just gate closed. <laughs> yeah, know, exactly. So. And we want to keep everything easy because we want to encourage as many people as possible to grow their own food. I think that is the mission at the end of the day, you know, is um, to grow your own food and live your best life, basically. Excellent. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it, Lisa. Thank you for joining us here on Big Blend Radio's Garden Gossip Show. Thanks for growing with us. You can follow us at BigBlendRadio.com.